Well, good morning. We want to welcome you to Bear Life Church. We want to welcome everybody watching online. We want to welcome everybody in the house here at Moria. We want to welcome everybody at Grayson. Come on, can we get for our Grayson campus? We love those guys. Man, through Pastor Aaron, what God is doing there, and soon to be our Ashland campus. I'm gonna go down to Ashland tonight, get to preach to our launch team. We've been doing that for the last several weeks, going down in the evenings on Sunday and get to just go and, and speak into their life and share with them what God has been doing here in Moorhead, what God has been doing in Grayson, and what we believe that God is gonna do in the Boy County area. And so we're super excited about that. It's an honor and privilege we're to go down just to hang out with them. And, and so we're continuing with this uh, series that we're in called What is Christmas? And last week, I asked you the question, what is Christmas? This past week, I was at an event that took place, and, and they went around, and they asked a bunch of kids, what is Christmas? And, and you know how kids are. You love it. You, you got to be careful when you hand a kid a microphone, especially if you're live. If you're recording, you can always edit it, right? But if you're live, and so the kids, you know, said exactly what most people say. It's about family. It's about, you know, it's about Jesus. It's about presence. It's about some guy with a big white beard that drinks milk and eats cookies. You know, so all the kids went around and said, you know, what they thought Christmas is. But the same is true. You know, what is Christmas to you? Christmas can mean a lot of things. For some people, it's just another day. For a lot of people, hey, it's just another day off. I just get another day off to be with my family. For some of us, you think it's good food, and you maybe get to watch some things on TV, hang back, hang tight, and hang out with your family. But what does Christmas truly mean? And I said last week, we're gonna look at the most famous verse in the Bible, which I believe is the most known verse in the Bible, which would be John 3.16. And John 3.16, and I'm gonna just read this so we're on the same page, because a lot of you memorize it in different Bible translations when you were a kid, probably. But John 3.16 said, for God so loved... And last week we said Christmas is love. Not only do we love our family, but God loved us so much that he sent his son. That Christmas is love. That God saw us even yet while we were sinners and he died for me and he died for you. That's how much he loves us. So we go through the Christmas season, we experience love, we feel love, but I want us to stop and pause and realize that love comes from him, that Christmas is love, that God loved us so much, let's keep reading, that he what? That he gave. That God was so generous that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes him shall not perish but have eternal life. I, I wanna talk to you today, not only is Christmas is love, that's what we talked about last week. And let me just go on and say last week's message, uh, if you missed it, if you're watching online, I went through Romans chapter eight. And Roman, it, it, like if you were stranded on an island and you only could take one chapter of the Bible with you to that island and someone, I know it's kind of a crazy, that's reality TV, right? But if someone did happen that, like what would that be? For me, probably it would be Romans chapter eight. If I could just take Romans chapter eight with me everywhere I go, because that chapter meant so much to me 11 years ago when I went through a really, you know, emotional time in my life with anxiety and panic attacks. It was Romans chapter eight that God just became my North Star in that, that that's why I just focused on and God used it. So what I preached last week was out of what God revealed in me over the last, well, 11 years ago when I went through it. So if, if you missed it last week, I wanna encourage you to go back because that was the message that God really just spoke into my life that he is love and how much that he loved me even in the midst of everything that's going on in my life. But today we focus on not as God is love, but Christmas is love, but Christmas is giving. And we know this, right? That if you, if you work at a nonprofit organization, most nonprofits across the country, their budget is not met until the month of December. That's, that's just factual stuff. It's usually the month of December. If they even meet budget, most of them don't even meet budget. They, they run in a deficit. They run in the red uh, all year long. But it's usually around the Christmas time. Why? Because there's something about the spirit of giving. That's why people ask you to help them. That's why organizations stand and they may even ring a bell or when you're checking out somewhere, do you wanna donate a dollar towards so-and-so? Why? Because this is the season, right? That most people are cheerful, that most people are in this giving uh, spirit. So that they know that, so let's capitalize on it. So if you're in the mood of giving, let's begin to give. And so this is a season that happens, but I want you to understand that Christmas is giving. And the reason why is because God so loved that he gave, that he was so generous that he gave his only son for me and for you. And so that's what I really wanna to focus on today is what does it mean when I say Christmas is giving? So if you have your Bibles, I want you to go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter eight, if you have your phone, you can go to the Bible app. I'm using the New Living Translation. You can follow along with me in the New Living Translation. 
But I wanna talk about how Christmas is giving. Now, sit tight, hang tight, because usually, you know, when a lot of times churches talk about giving or money and stuff, people get up tight about stuff. You know, one thing that we've really tried to do for the last 14 years here is before we ever do anything, like today we took up our year in offering, and this, we've asked you, we've done this for the last 14 years, just go and pray and whatever the Lord tells you to do, do, uh, just do it. And we, we always wanted to take up offering before because I don't ever want you to leave here that one, you feel guilt to give, pressure to give. You should never manipulate someone's emotions to give. And I'm gonna be very honest, and it's not to slam organizations, to slam, but most people know that if I can guilt you into giving, that you will give. In fact, psychologists would say the number one reason why people give is out of guilt. Wealthy people give out of guilt because they feel guilty because of what they have. And so when people try to guilt you into giving, like show you animals that are being destroyed and play a very sad, sad song. You already know what I'm going. In the arms of an, I know you're already there, you're already there, right? I, I love pets, I have one now. He's psycho, but I love my dog. And, and so I, I have that. So I, I'm not against pets. But the whole point is that you're, you're trying to manipulate me emotionally to feel sorry and to be guilt and have a guilty conscience that I should be a part of that. See, God's different, that's not why we give. That's not why, and anyone who ever stands or any communicator tries to guilt you or pressure you, their motives are not pure. Now they may have pure because they wanna see what God wants to do, but you don't manipulate people, you don't pressure, you don't guilt people to give. That's not why we do, and so the Apostle Paul lines this up for us, because giving's just not about finances, it's not about just your money. In fact, the Bible talks more about money than it does heaven, hell, and love, and all this combined. And so we, we need to address it and talk about things like that, but when we talk about giving, we want you to understand when we talk about money at Bear Life Church, we're just not talking about giving. We're gonna tell you, how do you handle your money? How do you win? How do you become financially free? How do you get on a budget? How do you start saving your money? How do you spend your money? Why? How do you invest your money? So the Bible's full of all these things. I never forget when we were, I don't know, we was probably 16 months old as a church. We were sitting there, we did this series called Crazy Love, and we did some crazy things, and, and that series talked about how much God loves us. And I never forget one day I was talking about how God's so generous to us. And we got to the end of the message and we did the offerings typically at the end of it, except the days that we talk about giving. I wanna make sure the offering's taken up front so you're going, oh gosh, honey, better get the check, but the priest talked about giving, gotta give. I never want you to feel that way. I never want you to feel that way. And so we're sitting there and, and I told everybody I was preaching, it was at the end of the message, I said, now I want everybody to, to, to take out your offering and your tithes and your offering today. Well, we weren't doing online giving yet. So people weren't giving online. So it's like, it was very awkward because you could say, oh my gosh, you could tell the people like, oh, get your purse, honey, get the purse. So act like you're giving. <laughs> and so people was like scrambling, going through and somebody pulling their wallet out and people's like, and they're holding their, their offering. We was at the conference center and they're holding their offering. And you know, I said, look at your offering. And then they feel awkward, so then you really grab something, right? So, so people are grabbing stuff and they're writing a check real fast. And it, was, it was hilarious, it was so funny. And everybody was sitting, and they took it. I said, now I want you to look at your offering. And everybody was just kind of looked their head down and they looked at their offering. I said, I want you to stare at your offering. And everybody kind of just started staring at their offering. And I said, here's what I want you to do. This week, I don't, we're not gonna take up an offering. Whatever you have in your hands, we're gonna ask you to give it away and bless someone. Well, man, you can hear a pin drop. You could hear everybody's like, what, you mean, yeah, we're only like 16 months old. We, we, you know, offerings matter for organizations, you know, how it goes to say that we're not gonna take up an offering date. Whatever's in your hand, I want you to go and you bless people. And man, you will not believe. We created a, a website where people kind of respond what they did with the money. People bought tires for people. People paid a house payment. People paid a, a rent payment. People was giving groceries. Like everyone began to list of how they bless people with their offering. Well, after the service, a guy came up to me and said, preacher, I said, yes, sir. He said, uh, I, gotta, I gotta ask you about this. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, in my business, you know, how I get paid and stuff, he said, you know, I haven't, you know, gave in the last like three months and, and I came today with my check to give. I said, okay, and he even told me how much it was. I don't know what people give. I don't check people, I don't, I'm not looking at your giving. He said, I, 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 it, I, it's a big check. And I said, okay, and he told me how much it was, which was almost about a month of an offering for us at that time. He said, you, at, you really want me to go give this away? I said, yes, go give it away. And it, about Florida, why? Because we're not about your money. We don't want your money. God don't want your money. If God wants your money, he will beat you up right now and take your money. You know that, right? God does, he don't give a rip about your money. What does God want? He wants your heart. 
Because if he has your heart, he has everything. Watch this, not just my money, he has my marriage. He has my parenting. He has my business. He has my investments. He has my career. He has my education. Like if I just give him my heart, he has everything. So it's not about your money. So I just want you just to hang tight because usually people get tense about when we talk about money and that says more about between you and the Lord, not between you and the church. And so let's just talk about what does it mean to be a generous person? I'm not talking about tithe today. Tithe we already talked about before a long time ago. Tithe we know that we give. That belongs to the Lord. Today is a free will offering. It's your choice. It's what God puts on your heart to bless people. A tithe belongs to him. That's 10% of your income. It goes, we don't designate the tithe because it's not ours to designate. That belongs to us. So today's about, what do I give an offering? Why do I be generous? And what's the importance of being generous? So when we look here at 2 Corinthians chapter eight, there's some things, let me put it in the context so we're on the same page because really what Paul did right here, what he felt led to do is what we've been doing for the last several years at around the end of the year, taking a year in offering. But the church in Jerusalem was really poor. They were in a hard financial situation because of persecution. And they're really, really poor, and they didn't have the means even to carry on with the families within the church. So Paul sends letters out. That's why we have a lot of the New Testament or letters that Paul wrote to the churches. And Paul sends the letter out to all the churches. says, listen, our brothers and sisters in Jerusalem, they're struggling, they're persecuted, they're in financial distress. Let's step up and let's help them. So go take up a free will offering and let's send it to the church of Jerusalem and let's make sure that they have the fun. Let's let them know how much we love them and how generous we can be. That's what Paul talks about. That's what's going on in the context. But there was this little church in Macedonia that, that God just radically used. It was very impoverished. They didn't have anything and they supernaturally just gave above to me and God used them. So Paul writes about the church of Macedonia to the churches in Corinthians. That's why we're here in, in, in Corinthians. In Corinth, he writes to the church and says, listen, look at this church. They had nothing, but yet God is using them greatly in your life. So he's writing to the Corinthians church and said, hey guys, to all the churches that meet in the city of Corinth, he said, let's step up and let's help Jerusalem. So that's what we're reading when we read 2 Corinthians chapter eight and nine. That's what Paul is writing to, to the churches, that they gave sacrificially, radically, and they gave generously. So we pick up in chapter eight, verse one. If you're ready to get started, come on, say, let's go. You're a little nervous this morning. Just hang tight, don't be nervous. This is good stuff, I love this. Watch this. Now, in chapter eight, verse one, listen to what Paul says. Now, he's writing to the church, talking about the churches in Macedonia, and he says, listen, what's going on? Here's what's taking place. He says, now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles. They got a lot of problems, yet they are very poor. But they are also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. What is he trying to say? Their joy, like giving is very enjoyable. Their joy to be able to participate in this to help you is overflowing so much so they're gonna be generous towards you. Verse three, for I can testify, Paul says I was there, I could testify or I, I've been part of this, that they gave not only what they could afford, but they gave far more than they did on their own and they did it on their own free will. What is he saying? He said they gave supernaturally. It's one thing to give what you can afford. You know, you get on a budget, you look at it, you say, okay, okay, what, what can we afford to give? That's great, you should be wise in that, absolutely. That's called being smart with your money, win with your money. And I'm gonna be honest, most people don't know how to win with their money. We have financial coaches here trained and they can help you learn how to win with your money. I'm talking about get on a budget, make sure you're saving for retirement, make sure you have things that you need. How are you gonna pay off the credit card bill in January? Because it's coming, y'all. You know what I'm saying? It's coming. Everything you're gonna spend is on it. Like, how do you do those things? How do you become financially free? We wanna help you do that. But these guys, watch this, they looked at their budget and said the numbers don't work. And they gave far more than they could. That's a supernatural giving. And if that's you and you ever give supernaturally, you better make sure you hear from the Lord. That they gave supernaturally above what they could have give because they really believed what God was up to and they wanted to be part of it. Verse four, they begged us again and again and again. Now watch this, the church begged to take up an offering. You ever been a part of church like that? <laughs> you know, like, take up an offering, we wanna help people. They begged us again and again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift of the believers in Jerusalem. They gave with enthusiasm, they gave with passion to say, hey, come on, let's make this happen. Let us count, we wanna be part of the movement. We wanna help the brothers and the sisters out. But this is the key, verse five. This is the key. 
This is where generosity starts in anything. Generosity with your time and you go help and serve people and you donate your time to people. It doesn't matter. Your resources, this is where it begins right here. Verse five. They even did more than we hoped for because, why? Here it is. First, the very first action they did is that they gave themselves to the Lord and then they gave themselves to us just as God wanted them to do. You know what? As God has given himself to us, watch this, we give ourselves to the Lord. And I'm here to tell you, when you fully have given yourself to the Lord, you'll do what he tells you to do, you'll go where he tells you to go, you'll give what he tells you to give, you'll serve what he tells you to serve. Why? Because you first gave to him. Christmas is giving. God gave his son to us, then we give ourselves to him. And when we give ourselves to him, then he's in complete control of my life. And I'm gonna be very honest with you. There's so many of us. We wanna come and we say, listen, I will give my life to Jesus because I don't wanna go to hell. Do not wanna go there. Awesome. He loves me that much. He's forgiven me. I trust him. He's gonna take me to heaven. But then we said, but God, I'm not gonna trust you in my marriage or I'm not gonna trust you in my career. I'm not gonna trust you in my finances. I'm not gonna trust you in my relationships. I'm gonna pick who I want. I'm gonna do what I want. I'm gonna go where I want. I'm gonna spend what I want. I'm gonna buy what I want. So God, thank you for getting me out of hell, but I wanna be in control of my life. Then Jesus is not the Lord of your life. Lord means he's in complete control of everything, every area of your life. And when the faster you get to that point, the faster you say, God, okay, all right, everything I have is yours, everything belongs to you, then what do you want me to do? You'll be amazed how God will use you to change, watch this, family trees. God will use you to change generations to come if you'll get in the posture that, and you do what they did, they first gave themselves to the Lord and then they gave themselves to us. And that is, I believe, what God wants to do in your life. So why then, because this would be the question, then why then do we do what we do? Why do we even do what we just did right now? You know, we already have mission funds that sit inside that when disasters take place that just happened right here in our own state of Kentucky, that because of our generosity as a church, we're already in position to go and help and fund that organization or help and fund. We even have teams, like for instance, if you like the disaster relief and you wanna be part of that, we have teams that will leave here who will go to West Kentucky and be part of it. And if you wanna be part of a team like that, obviously you have to be trained and skilled on how to use a chainsaw, how to chaplain people, because people who come out and they've lost everything, how do you minister to people that way? There's a training that we will send you to that you can go and get trained that when things like this happen in floods or, or natural disasters like this, we will send teams out to go be part of it. Why do we do what we do? Why do we do this? Why do we take up an offering? Why in the world are we even asking you to be a generous person? You think because we need your money? You, you think because God's after your money? That's a lie straight from the devil because he don't need it. Why does God and why do we every year ask people to step up and give a free will offering to be generous? I'm gonna tell you why we do what we do. And so as you walk through this, because we're gonna look right at the text and we believe, listen, I, I'm so naive to believe that this is God's inspired word that it's infallible, it speaks to us. God has said what he wanted to say. He means what he wants to me. God does not lie. And whatever promises is in this book, there's over 7,000 of them, it declares that every one of us, if we, there are conditions based on some of them, if we, God will. And so I just think that we just need to trust the Lord when it comes to this area, just being generous in our life. So why do we do what we do? So if you're taking notes, here's the first reason, here's the first why we do what we do. One, it will increase. In our life, it will increase my love for Jesus. That when I give generously of myself, of my time, of my resources, when I give, it will increase my love for him. Paul tells us here in verse seven, look what he says. Since you excel in so many ways, this church, they excel. You got great faith, you got great communicators and preachers, very gifted speakers, you're knowledgeable of the text, you're very passionate, you got all this enthusiasm within you, and your love from us. I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. You excel in everything else, but you need to excel in this act of giving. I'm not commanding you to do this. You see this, this is a free offering, this is a free. I'm not commanding you, I'm not pressuring you, this is between you and the Lord. But I am testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of the other churches. Here's what he's saying. 
You're, you're, I'm gonna test the love within you because when you're generous, it will increase your love and your affections for other people. There's something within you that will begin to change when you are generous to the people around you. And he will, he will do this in your life. You know, a lot of people, you may have heard people quote this. Let, let's, you, you may even can finish the statement with me. Where your heart is, there what? What will be there? Where your heart is, there will be your, you'll hear people, I hear you whispering treasure. You can say out loud, okay? I know we're kind of Baptist, but you can speak out loud here, okay? You can talk back to me. All right, you can say amen every now and then. So let's, and so, so where your heart is, your treasure is. And that's what people quote. That's misquoting the scripture. That is not what the scripture says. The scripture says where your treasure is, then your heart will follow. People think treasures follow your heart. No, 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 where your treasure is, your heart will follow it. So wherever you're placing your, your finance, where you're placing your treasure, your heart will be there. And for most of it, it's MasterCard, Visa. Come on now, don't sit there like you have a halo. You know what I'm talking about, right? The debt, right, where, you, where, you, where your treasure is, your heart will follow after it. And so what he's trying to say, I'm gonna see where your heart is by where your treasure is in your life. And if you will be generous, it would increase your love for Jesus. Here's the second thing it would do. It would actually make me more like Jesus. Jesus says, I've come to give my life as a ransom for God so loved that he gave. You're never more like Jesus like where you are when you're giving and serving the people around you. He said, I didn't come to be served, I come to serve you. I come to give my life to you. And it makes me more like Jesus. Listen to what he says in verse nine. You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see how generous his grace is? How generous his grace? That when you sin, his grace covers it. How generous is his grace? That yet while you was a sinner, he died for you. How generous is his grace? He cancels out hell and he guarantees you heaven. His grace is generous. He says, how generous is his grace? Look at that, compare to that. Though he was rich, Yet for your sake he became poor so that by his poverty he could make you rich. And he's talking about not wealthy. He's not talking about riches like in items, but rich in Christ and the eternity and the things that God has for you. When I give, watch this, it increases my love for Jesus, but watch this, it makes me more like Jesus. The more I do this, the more I become like him. And this is the big one, number three, it will deepen your faith. You know, the disciple says, God, increase our faith. Jesus, increase our faith. And basically, Jesus says, increase your obedience. Because if you increase your obedience, your faith will grow. You want me to grow your faith? If you had faith the size of a mercy, man, you could do great things. You want your faith to increase? Then be obedient to my word. And if you obey me, your faith will increase. Increase, 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 increase. If you just obey me. Look what he says, I love this. Let's, let's put it into context right here in Eastern Kentucky where we can understand this. He says, remember this. Then he tells the story. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. Now let me stop right there. Now that makes sense, right? If I sit here and I broadcast a few seeds out in my field, I'm gonna get a few crops. But if I take the whole bag and I broadcast the whole bag or, or sow the whole field, now I have an opportunity to reap a big harvest, right? This makes sense. But back then, the farmers had a choice. I could take a little bit of my seed and plant it, but there's a lot of factors that are out of my control. I can't control the rain. I can't control the sun. I can't control the weather. I can't control the birds. I can try, but I can't. I can't control tariffs, right, coming in on farmers and destroying right now. I, I can't control this. So I got a, I got a decision to make throw a little bit of seed out, keep the bag of seed at home, so that if we have a really bad harvest, at least my kids and my family can eat the seeds. Or, I gotta trust. And I'm gonna take all the seed out of the bag and I'm just gonna sow it generously. And then I'm gonna say, God, it's all you. I can't make it rain. I can't make the sun come out. I can't control the animals. I can't control the weather. I can't control the frost. So I'm gonna trust you. So I'm gonna take everything I have. I'm gonna sow it generously and then I'm gonna step back and say, but God, only you can do it. I've tilled the ground. I've prepared it. I've dug the ditch. I've got everything in place. But God, you're the one that can make it rain. Paul is writing to them to say, you understand that, right? You get that. Sure, I, I understand it. Let's keep reading. He says here in verse seven, so you must each decide in your own heart how much to give. 
What is he saying? It's your choice. This is an offering. It's not your tithe. This is whatever the Lord tells you to do. We've said this from day one. Whatever the Lord tells you to do, do it. That's between you and the Lord. You must decide how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. So if you hear a message like, oh gosh, man, Pastor talking about money, could get your checkbook, honey, drop a 20, we gotta write something, we gotta be part of it, it's our church, right? If that is your attitude, don't even give. Because we're not trying to pressure you. We're not bringing people in and make you cry and say, listen, this is what you gotta give to or they're not gonna eat. God said, no, no, no. When you give an offering, you get to do this. It should come out of abundance of going, God, I can't believe you've blessed me. I can't believe I get to be part of this. And now let's help the people around us. And I'm gonna give cheerfully, not out of grudge or, or guilt or manipulation or pressure. That should never be the reason why we give. It should be out of, guess what? God has blessed us. And guys, we are rich. Every one of us are rich. If you make over $40,000 a year as a gross family income, you're in the top 1% wealthiest people in the world. Your garbage disposal will eat more this Christmas than most people in the planet. We're so rich, we have houses for our cars, their car garage. And most of you don't park it because you got junk you don't even need in your garage where you can't put your car in its own house. And you go around going, I'm broke. We're rich. God has blessed us, every one of us. And listen, if you have this food, shelter, and water, you're rich. You see what I'm saying? God has blessed us so much. So you must decide and give cheerfully. And watch this. And God will generously provide all you need. Now, why don't we let that sink in? And then you'll always have everything you need and plenty left over to do to what? To hoard it? What does Paul say? The reason why God blesses you is so you'll be a blessing to other people. And don't miss this. You will have every single thing you need. The farmer, go back to it. I gotta make a decision. I can scatter all the seed and it might be a bad summer, fall, winter, and my family might starve. Or I'm just gonna trust God because God, you promised me that you would meet all my needs. So God, I'm gonna trust you and I'm gonna scatter the seed and guess what happens? The crops will grow, God will bless and guess what that will do to you? It would increase your faith and you'll go, I cannot believe God came through. God done it then, he'll do it again. Listen, every single person who ties has the exact same testimony. I'm blessed. I can't believe I get to do this. Everyone who does it has the exact same testimony. I can't afford it. And you'll never be able to afford a tithe until you start tithing. Because then you will have all that you need. That's a promise from scripture. You then call God a liar? Call him a liar. But he just told you he will meet all your needs if you'll just be generous and do what he asks you to do. And you'll have more left over, not to hoard it, not to keep it, and we talk about that. You should take your money, you should bring it back to the Lord, you should save your money, you should spend wisely your money, you should invest and save your money, and then whatever you have left over, you should use it to bless people. We've been teaching that for 14 years. And you're like, well, I'm not there yet. Start from the beginning, bring to God what's his, start saving, start spending, paying off debt wisely. We got, there's a way to do this, the scripture says it. And then God says, test me. So either he's a liar or he's not. And what just amazes me is that so many people have faith in a God whom they have not seen to take them to a place that they don't even know yet where, it's called heaven, but they don't know how, what, how all it's gonna be, and has forgiven them of all their sin, but you cannot trust him to put food on the table. See, when I'm generous, God knows that this is gonna be a stronghold in my life. So what happens, you know what the, you know what the antidote to greed is? generosity, and when you live with the open hands and you say, God, I'm gonna give my first self, my self to you, everything I have belongs to you. Take what you want, give what you want, I'm just a conduit. And we say this all the time, you don't give to our church. You give through our church to bless the people around us. We've said that all the time. And what happens, it increases my faith, it increases my faith, it increases my faith, and all of a sudden when God tells you to do something, say, okay, just do it, because God said to do it. He's always provided. 
He will always meet our need. And that's what that will do. That will cause other people to thank God when you're generous. When you become generous, it will cause other people to thank God. Look what he says in verse 10. For God is the one who provides the seed to the farmer. Remember, going back to it, the farmer can't grow the seed. The seed, God provides the seed and the bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources. Did you see that? He will increase your resources and produce a great harvest of generosity in you. See, some of us, so right now, we're doing everything in our power to increase our resources. And we think by saving, being greedy, and stingy, or holding it, and hoarding it. God's like, in my kingdom, it's different. If you'll be generous, I will increase it. You try to hoard it, hold it to yourself, according to the scripture, it won't. So trust me. Trust me. I just, I just don't want. Trust me. Trust me. And I will increase your resources and I will produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched, verse 11, in every way so that you can always be generous. And when you take your gifts to those who need them, look what that happens. They will thank God because of you. I wish I could sit here and share with you the emails and the letters and the cards we get over and over and over. Thank you so much because you were able to keep our, not me, because of the church, you were able to keep your, our lights on. Thank you so much. We were able to buy diapers for my baby. Thank you so much. We was able to, to make our house. Thank you so much. You were able to pay off millions of dollars with the medical debts for pennies. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You would not believe how many people are saying thank you because of Better Life Church. Now, I wish I could just display all that up here for you so you could see how God is using your generosity. 2,000 inmates over in West Liberty, 2,000 inmates have no idea. They're about to receive a gift on behalf of Better Life Church. People who have forgotten about, people who have moved on, people who've messed up and done some things, but we always believe there's a second chance that God could do something in our life. Guess what? We will let them know that we're praying for them, that God's not giving up on them, that God loves them, and let's bless them. That's what you get to be a part of. And that's what's so exciting about being able to do what we do, that we're able to be generous and people will thank God. Now, it goes on and says, this is in chapter nine, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you to flip over to chapter nine, that was chapter eight, but chapter nine, that was verse 10, 11. And he says in verse 12, so two good things will come out of the ministry of giving. What? The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met, people's needs will be met, and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. And so you know what will happen because you're generous? You know what will take place? Not only the benefits to you, then the Bible is full of that. And I'm gonna tell you, listen to me, please listen to me, please. You never give to get. And I believe that people, would, hopefully with good intentions, will stand on the stage and they'll preach to people and they'll name it, claim it. It's all about prosperity. They think that you can manipulate God and you can get blessings from God. That's not how that works. You never give to get. I had a guy one time, he came and said, Pastor, I took your challenge. I said, okay, what challenge? He said, start tithing. I said, awesome, great. It's not between me and you. I'm not your priest, bro. That's between you and the Lord. I don't need to know what you do. That's your money, man. Well, I just want you to know I start tithing. I said, awesome, great. He said, but I ain't got blessed yet. <laughs> he said, it still ain't working. Like, where's the blessing? Like, I I'm tithing, but man, where is it? I said, sir, I'm gonna be very honest with you because I love you. You ain't gonna get blessed. What do you mean I ain't gonna get blessed? He kind of blessed. He said, I'm giving. I said, you, you ain't gonna get blessed, man. Well, you said, no, no, no. You're giving with the wrong motives. God don't give a rip about how, and your dollars. It's your heart. And if I give to get something, your motives of impure, God won't bless that. But when you get to the point, you says, I get to give, and I give to give, guess what? Then you'll get he never came back and talked to me, but it's all right, it's all right. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it worked out. I have no idea. But here's just the big and the last and final point is this. Here's what will happen. This will honor God as a witness to the world. This will honor God as a witness to the world. And when God sees what his people are doing and the world begins to see how his people are blessing people, like I made this comment when we first started the church 14 years ago, and we're getting ready to celebrate our 14th anniversary here at the end of January. I said, they said, here's what I really like to see. I would like to see a church that loves its city 
it serves its city, and it blesses its city, that if we ever left here, that the city would beg us to stay because of the impact of the people at Bear Life Church. And I said, you know, there's gonna probably come a day people say, listen, I don't know if I agree with everything in that church. I don't the pastor wears jeans with holes in it, which that just messed up right there. Like, they got drums and guitars on stage, but let me tell you something about it. That's the most loving, generous, serving church I've ever seen in my life. Because here's how you win people and show the world. You serve them and you bless them. You serve them and you bless them. And when you serve people and bless you who don't like you, you know what will happen? The hearts begin to get softer, and the hardness of the heart begins to get chiseled away. And they'll say, why do you bless us and serve us knowing we don't even like you? Because what will happen, verse 13, as a result of your ministry, the ministry of what? The ministry of giving, being generous. They will give glory to God for your generosity to them and to all the believers who proved their obedience, that you're obedient to the good news. Why do we do what we do? Because we wanna be obedient to the good news. What's the good news? For God so loved that he gave. He was generous. He gave his only son. Listen, I love my kids. They ain't nowhere in the world I give my kids up for you. I'm gonna expect you to give your kid up for me. God gave it up for the whole world, even the ones who were turning their back on him. That's how much he loves us. And then it goes on down and says in verse 15, is a very memorable verse that people says, and he goes on and says, it's not on the screens, but thanks be to God for what? His indescribable gift. And what was his gift? The gift was his son. He gave to you and he gave to me. So here's the invitation. <laughs> I'm not here trying to take up an offering from you. You be generous, that's between you and the Lord. There's people around us that need to be blessed. Go be a blessing. And guess what comes from that? Please, not guilt. Don't give out of guilt. Don't get out of a compulsion. Don't give out of a pressure. Give because he gave to me. Give because he's blessed me. And if you could do anything, this is, this is, this is the next step, the application. Give yourself to the Lord. Not just your heart for your salvation. Go, God, I'm gonna give you everything. I'm gonna give you my marriage. I'm gonna give you my parenting right now. It's tough. I'm gonna give you my family. I'm gonna give you my school. I don't even know what I'm gonna do with my life, but I'm, I'm here for a reason. I'm gonna give you my career. God, I made some really poor financial decisions. And I'm gonna give you my finances. And I'm gonna do what your Bible says. I'm gonna do what your word says because I'm gonna trust you. I'm gonna give it all to you. Help me now manage my life, my family, my career. All this. God, I'm gonna give my life. And folks, when you give your life, God will do a great work in you. And guess what? Generosity will flow from you. And not just one time a year in a giving season. But all your life, you're in a posture of just blessing people around you. Why? Because God blessed you. I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads just for a moment. This is one of my favorite things to talk about. I don't know if you know that or not. I love this. And the reason why is because for the last 22 years of my life, I have put God to the test. And the exact thing, same things I'm speaking and preaching to you, I have seen it. I have seen God move in unbelievable ways. And I want that for you. So this is a time between you and the Lord, man. This is... This is the time you realize how much he loves you and that he gave himself. So why don't you begin to pray, God, would you stir in my heart affection of generosity that I will serve and bless people around me. I will serve and make a difference. And please, I want you to hear this. Generosity is not an amount. Generosity is an attitude. Not an amount, it's an attitude. And so in this Christmas season, let's not forget, Christmas is love and Christmas is giving that God so loved that he gave.
And so if you're here today at one of our campuses or location, I wanna encourage you, listen, give your life to Jesus. If you've never given your life to Jesus, right now you can do that. You can cry to him and say, Jesus, I believe. I believe you came for me and you died for me. And I believe you got up out of the grave for me. And as best as I know how, I'm repenting my sin and I'm gonna put all my faith in you. Now help me live for you for all the days of my life. You know, I'm gonna trust that several of you prayed that with me online and at one of our campuses. If that's you, host is gonna come out just in a moment and tell you what your next steps are. And I wanna encourage you this week as we go into the Christmas season that next Sunday is our Christmas services. Would you begin to go ahead and pray and maybe even fast for the people that you're gonna bring that needs to hear that God loves them and that your spouse or your kid or your coach or your classmate, your fraternity brother, your sorority sister, whoever is, hear the gospel? Would you begin to pray that God would open their eyes the next Sunday that you would bring them or get them to a place, invite them over to your house if you're watching online and say, come on, you're coming over. Because we wanna see people saved more than anything else here at Barrel Life Church. Father, thank you so much for your generosity. Thank you that you gave your son. Can't even understand that, can't even fathom it. All I can say is thank you. And I pray, God, that you will continue to do a great work through Better Life Church of the hundreds and thousands of people that will be blessed because of your people this Christmas season. I can't wait to hear the stories. I can't wait to see how you use your money and direct it to impact lives. But more important, I can't wait to hear of the people who come to faith in your son. I can't believe we even get to do this. Thank you so much, Jesus. For your name I ask and I pray, amen.